All right, good morning. I want to talk about the basic elements of fiction and give you some ways to analyze those basic parts so that when you have an upcoming assignment where you need to analyze a piece of fiction literature, you'll have something in your toolkit that you can actually use. A lot of times we respond to a piece of literature by looking at the whole story. How did I feel after I finished that book or after that movie was over? But that's not really an analysis. That's just an impression. So you could walk out of the last James Bond movie or you could finish reading a short story assignment in this class and go, well, that was good or I really didn't like that. But neither of those is an analysis. Those are just opinions. So we've got to give you some tools. We've got to give you a kind of ruler that you can lay up against a piece of fiction to measure what worked and what didn't work. Then when you write your analysis, you've got something to hang your hat on if people still wear hats anymore. So all fiction has five basic pieces. It's always going to have a plot. It's always going to have characters. It's always going to have setting. The writer is going to have some kind of style. And the toughest one to figure out, I think, is the theme, that there's some sort of message or meaning underlying this piece of fiction. So I'm going to save that most difficult one for last, because I think if you have the other parts, it will be easier to see that one. So when we talk about the plot, we're really answering the question, what happened? And I show you there one book called Master Plots. And it's published by Professional Writers Organization. And it extends a theory that says there are only so many basic stories. And then we dress them up or we put them in different places and we tell the story, but it's still the same basic story. It's like the play or the movie West Side Story is really Romeo and Juliet. It's still, it's a boy meets girl story. It's a romance with two feuding families. So it, it doesn't matter who the characters are. It doesn't matter when and where the story takes place. There are only so many kinds of stories to tell. So if we believe in that theory, there are a few basic types. We can talk about rags to riches, like David Copperfield, where somebody starts out poor and we watch them work to become successful. Or we could have a story where they start out rich and lose everything and learn some moral lesson from all of their sufferings. The book of Job in the Bible would be an example of that. We can certainly have revenge stories. We can have romance stories. We can even have stories where there might only be one character in it, which would be the man versus nature, where you put a character out in the wilderness, whether it's the North Woods or the desert or out at sea, and somehow they have to survive. And the rugged country that they're going through kind of becomes the other character. And most fiction, especially drama, is going to revolve around a dramatic decision. The choosing of a path. Should I do this or should I do that? It could be something as simple as should Archie pick Betty or Veronica. But the idea of having a choice is often the spark plug for making a story take place that putting the character in a situation where they have to choose is a way that many stories are built. A theorist who, who talked about myths, Joseph Campbell, says that every hero basically is going through the same story. So if we looked at this little model and thought of it as being a two-hour movie, 
where we've got 30 minutes to start, an hour in the middle, and 30 minutes to wrap it up. Every hero goes through this same kind of thing. They're living their regular life. Some sort of adventure or situation comes up, and the hero oftentimes doesn't want to do it, doesn't want to go on the quest, doesn't want to meet that challenge. And there's somebody who advises them, who helps them get over it. So Luke Skywalker had Yoda. Something happens in the story that forces our character to get into the adventure. So some evil force, his country gets invaded, somebody gets sick. Whatever it is, something happens that makes our character have to get into the business of the story. Now they've crossed over and they're into actually doing the work of the adventure. And then they have their enemies and they make friends and they have to fight with different things and they have to overcome obstacles. So they battle and battle through the main part of the story. And then at some point they get to the moment of success and then they're working their way back to try to get home to get back to that normal condition that they started in, but hopefully wiser and more successful and they learned something and they met their goal. So every kind of story from the ancient Greek myths to Star Wars to whatever has this kind of shape to it. Now, if you do a piece of literature and you feel that it was unsatisfying, Maybe that part in the middle where the hero was supposed to go through a bunch of challenges wasn't very challenging, that it was too easy for the hero to win, or that the obstacles that were put in front of him were unrealistic and they were too tough and nobody could have won. That's a way that you could analyze and criticize the plot of the story. So see, now you have a couple of tools to figure out what kind of basic story is the author telling and how well did they have it laid out. Let's move on to another factor. Who are the characters in the story? A well-written piece of literature is going to give you a character to identify with, somebody to root for. Somebody that you hope succeeds in whatever it is they're trying to accomplish. Now, let me suggest that definitions you might think you know could be something different. When we think about a protagonist and an antagonist, we often confuse that with the hero and the villain. And it isn't always the same thing. The protagonist is just the person who is trying to get something done. And the antagonist is the person who is opposing them. Could the protagonist be the bad guy? Absolutely. So in the story of uh, Dracula, a classic novel, Dracula is actually the villain, but he's the one who was trying to take people over. The antagonist is Dracula's opponent. So in this case, the bad guy is the protagonist and the good guys are the antagonist. So you want, might want to think about how is this story being built? Is the character who was trying to get something accomplished on the side of good or evil? However, we know that any hero is only as good as the villain that opposes him. So Batman without the Joker, Luke Skywalker without Darth Vader, Sherlock Holmes without Moriarty, they don't work because the hero doesn't seem to be a big deal if the villain is weak. If the villain is strong and the hero can overcome him, then the hero has won, has made an achievement, has done something worthy of admiration. 
This is the same basic plot to a professional wrestling match. You have to have a good guy and a bad guy, or else you don't care who wins. Now, supporting characters are also important. A good writer is not going to just tell you all about the main character over and over and over. That's kind of boring to read. However, supporting characters give the main character somebody to talk to. Sometimes, like in The Great Gatsby, a supporting character actually narrates the story. So you are seeing the story through the eyes of a supporting character. That kind of gives you a skin to get inside of, to walk around in the story and get a feel for what's happening. Sometimes the main character isn't even in the scene, and you have two supporting characters talk about the main character. And from their conversation, you learn stuff. So that the supporting characters are not just pawns on a chessboard, pieces to throw away, but they are useful clues. They're markers on a map to help you figure out who's who and what's going on. Some of the literary heroes, by this point, you've already seen things from the Scarlet Letter, and Hester Prynne might be the very first female hero in American fiction. Captain Ahab in Moby Dick, chasing the great white whale, is not really a sympathetic character. He's not so much a nice person, but we understand he's the person who's having the quest. He's the hero who was on a journey. Whether we like him or not, he's the protagonist. He's the person trying to get something done. Jay Gatsby in The Great Gatsby absolutely is the main character of that story, but we don't get to see him all the time. We get to hear about him through the other characters talking about him and having their interactions caused by what Gatsby does. And next semester, you'll even see a character called Equality 72521 in a science fiction novella by one of my favorite authors. But that character also is trying to accomplish something. And what the author is trying to do is to get you to identify with that character and to want him to succeed. That way, you read the story in hopes that that person comes out a winner. So if the characters are not sympathetic, if they're not realistic, if you can't get into who they are and what they're trying to do, that's a place of analysis for you as well, where you can say these characters were weak or these characters did not act like real people would act or people might have acted like that back when this was written. But if those characters were today, they wouldn't act like that. And see how that gives you strong points to make and not just say, I didn't like the story. On to another factor you can use. And I wanted to touch on this before we leave. Does the villain ever think he's the villain of a story? And certainly you have run into villains already. In the Scarlet Letter, there was Dr. Chillingsworth. But the villain, in that case, he was trying to get back Hester Prynne. He was trying to restore the romance that he used to have. So he was trying to meet a goal, even though he was doing it by evil means. He was trying to put things straight in his opinion. In the Avengers movies, Thanos doesn't think he's a villain. He's just restoring order to the universe by erasing half of all the people. So that's his idea of balance, and that's what he's trying to do. Villains very often don't think they're the bad guy. They think instead that their view of things is just how it ought to be, and they're willing to do whatever is necessary. So just an extra thought for you about characters. You might want to look for some bad parts of the good characters, and you might want to look for the real goals of the bad characters. But every story takes place someplace. 
So if we were to do one of those man against nature stories, like the Call of the Wild or other Jack London adventure stories, if the character is not in freezing cold, far away from civilization, do we think the character is in any danger? We had the reference to Batman earlier. If a Batman story happens in broad daylight, high noon, is it as scary as it would have been if it happens at night in a shadowy city? So where we put the story makes a difference. But we should also be aware that it's when we put the story. So it's space and time. And if the setting is important to the story, it changes the story. So if if you wanted to tell a Western, but you tell that Western in Georgia, it's not nearly as good as if you tell that Western in Utah, here in the famous Monument Valley. Because there are things about being out West that drive that story, that create the distance where people have to travel, that create the harsh desert that's cold at night and steaming in the daytime. So without putting the Western in the West, the story doesn't work. I remember the first time I went to Arizona and I was driving from Phoenix up to the northern part of the state. And driving through that country, you see rocky cliffs and you see desert and you see cactus, you even see some tumbleweeds, tumbleweeds are real. And I was thinking, wow, this is like driving through a Western movie. And then I said to myself, because you are out West, this is the real place. So I kind of laughed at myself for a minute at what I had noticed. But if the setting of a story is important, it will change the story. So part of your analysis would be, could this story have happened someplace else? Could this story have happened in Victorian England, or did it have to happen in colonial United States? Did this story have to happen out west, or could it have happened in Orlando? And when you can answer that question, you can evaluate the importance of the setting to the story. And like I previously said, if the setting is very strong, it can almost be like another character that the hero has to struggle against, that these rugged conditions can be part of what the hero has to overcome. So that's another tool that we can use. Now, style is tough. Because until you have read a lot of different people, you may not notice any difference in style. Because you don't have any basis of comparison. Let me put it this way. In my time, I've owned a bunch of cars and I've rented some when I've been traveling. So I have a lot of experience driving different kinds of cars from different eras, right? Cars that were made in the 60s and cars that were made last year. And I've driven cars and trucks and sports cars and big cars and whatever. So if I get into a car, it takes me a minute to figure out, OK, where's the gear shift and how do you turn on the wipers and I got to adjust the seat. And different kinds of cars drive in different ways. Well, it's the same thing with different writers. Some writers write very plainly, very straightforward, short sentences, short words. Others dress up their writing with flowery phrases and complex structure and long paragraphs. And until you have read a bunch of different people, you can't recognize Charles Dickens from Mark Twain. 
They lived around the same time, but they wrote very differently. Because they were writing from different places and with different styles. I have here in this picture the American author Ernest Hemingway. Who wrote in a very plain, declarative, almost a newspaper type style. He was just going to tell you what was happening in plain language that anybody could understand. And this is a key to understanding the style of the writer. And here we have Charles Dickens, whose stories are famous and classic, but sometimes can be much thicker to try to read than would Hemingway, because Dickens had longer sentences and longer paragraphs. You might want to look at the vocabulary and the use of slang that appears in the writing. Because if the writer is using a complex, advanced vocabulary, that would be an element of the writer's style. How tuned in is this writer to using humor versus drama? So Mark Twain, for whom we still give the great American prize for humor every year, could put his characters in a dangerous situation. I mean, Tom Sawyer gets lost in a cave, but still tell that story with a sense of humor. And in the way he used his phrases, you might actually laugh out loud from time to time reading Mark Twain. It's very unlikely that you would laugh out loud reading Ernest Hemingway because he was very serious and his characters were in the middle of wars and other adventures. So nothing very funny going on. Another thing that you can use to establish the writer's style is how much they rely on description versus how much they rely on dialogue. And this is actually pretty easy to see on the page. If you see a lot of paragraphs, the writer is using a lot of description. The writer is telling you about stuff. If the writer has put a lot of quotations on the page, you're reading dialogue between two or more characters. So the characters are telling you what's going on instead of the writer. The author is letting the characters go about their business and reveal to you by what they say and do what the story is all about. If the writer is heavy on description, it's as if they're sitting up on high looking at what's going on and they're telling you about it. Both are equally valid ways of telling a story, but different writers will approach it in different ways so that their style could be text heavy or dialogue heavy. So do you see that that's another way that you can analyze the story? You can take a piece of fiction and look at the technique that the writer used. In a perfect world, as a writer, I would not want you to notice my style. I would want you to get so involved in my story that you wouldn't realize how it was put together. So if you're reading for enjoyment, that's fine. But academically, when you're reading for school, it's great that you enjoyed the story. But in order to do the work of an English student, you use these different factors to take the story apart and see how it was assembled. Now to the last one. This idea of theme. These stories that we read for 100, 200 years, or even all the way back to the ancient Greek myths, they must be important. They must have something to tell us, or we wouldn't be rereading them and teaching them to each generation that comes along. There's something important. There's something of value in these stories, or else we wouldn't keep revisiting them. 
And this is where we get to theme. It is not the moral of the story. That's a simplistic way to think about it, but that's probably not correct. If you're trying to look for some final teaching that happens in the last line of the book or the story, yeah, that's probably not going to be there. Instead, you accumulate this wisdom over the whole experience of reading the entire story. The theme is often going to be some commentary on the human condition. The reason that stories endure over the generations and over the centuries is that people are still people. So people still have love, hate, fear, honesty. We have these emotions and concepts that all people have always had. So I can read the Odyssey, the story of Ulysses getting home to Greece after the Trojan War, and that story is 4,000 years old. But it's still a story of a man trying to go home to his family. So as long as there are people and families and homes, that story still works. So when you find some common human element like that, that could belong to anybody anywhere at any time, now you're starting to see what the theme is. The author may not be trying to preach a sermon to you. They may not be outwardly trying to give you some moral lesson. And sometimes different readers get a different lesson out of the same story. So I might have read that story and see it as a man is trying to get home. Somebody else might read that story and say, well, this is about the cost of going to war. And both of them could be a correct theme. I read it as somebody who wants to get back with my family. Somebody else reads it as triggering memories of when they were at war. So people think different ways when they react to different stories. This means there isn't one answer for what the theme of a story is. Because different readers might see different things. In literature training, we actually talk about this as a kind of readings that if a woman reads a story instead of a man, then you might get a female reading of that story. If a younger person reads it instead of an older one, or if an Englishman reads it instead of an American, the angle that different people have in their lives could change the lens by which they see that story. So don't worry that you have to have the one right answer. Instead, Work at finding your answer based on what you can see from the story, what it made you learn, and we will all learn different lessons, and that's perfectly all right. So let me summarize this thing for you. We've got five points that we can use to analyze any story. So we've got a plot, we've got characters. We've got a setting, we've got the writer's style, and we've got a theme, some wisdom that we gain from the story. Now, don't believe that all five pieces are of equal size and strength in every story. It may be that you read a story where the characters didn't even have names. And the plot was little more than people sitting around talking. But where they were and what they were talking about 
was what made the story go. So that was a, a piece that really emphasized the setting and the theme. There's a whole play that is nothing but two people sitting in a restaurant talking about the third person who hasn't arrived yet. And they get a whole two hour play out of that because the things about life that the characters talk about and where they are, that's what makes it go. You might have a story that's all about the plot and the characters and the style of it. So you could take any cop story or any war story or any Western and okay, uh, this is going on and these characters have to get it done and the style is all action, action, action. Okay. And could be any movie that The Rock is in. That's all right. And just take The Rock and you put him in a different place and have him overcome some different enemies and obstacles. And at the end, The Rock wins and we all go, okay, that was entertaining. That was a good way to kill two hours. But there was no great moral lesson. And it didn't matter where he was or what he was doing. So if you analyze that, you'd have three things that would really be strong for you to talk about. And a couple of them you would talk about that were kind of weak and didn't really affect the story. So don't think that if you're doing an analysis, I've got to hit these five points and I got to write three sentences about each of the five points. They may not exist in the story of equal strength. So then I would suggest find the ones that really made the story pivot, that really made the story happen and spend my time talking about that and then mention the others merely to say that I know about them, but they really didn't come up much. They really didn't affect how this story turns out. All right, those are my prepared remarks. That's as much as I really need to say about it. But I think that will give you some tools that will allow you to organize the way you do a literary analysis now and into the future. Trust me, when you get to college or university, you're going to have these same five points, and that'll still be the outline that you'll use to analyze anything you run into in the future.